I can just go to work this way. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Do we use this space open? Do you use this space open here? Or is yes. Go ahead. That's an easier one. That's an easy one, right? Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, and, and so what I think absolutely has to happen is an entire tax overhaul of our tax system. Uh, it needs to become simpler. It needs to become fairer. It needs to become more predictable. And one of the ways to do that is to reduce some of the, some of the onerous for our economy, corporate tax loopholes that currently exist, which allows certain mega corporations to make billions of dollars off the tax code every year and pay zero federal income tax. If you want to create some immediate revenue, how about if we simplify the tax code? And I, I think this is I think it's unfair because small businesses don't have that advantage. And these loopholes are unless you have a big army of lawyers and lobbyists and maybe some friends in high places, you either don't get any such loopholes or you can't figure out what they are anyway. And at the same time, by lowering the rates across the board in our tax system. That allows then those people who say, well, wait, you're taking away my credit. Yes, but we're also lowering your rate. And this, this effective tax rate stuff is really just, it's just a way of playing games with the tax code. What's the statutory tax rate? That's what we should be operating on. And if you make it more predictable, then I believe people know how, how and when they're going to invest, when they're going to take risk. Not only here in this country, but people who want to invest in this country. Rob, I want to jump in and just give a quick clarification. This is how often these things go. So, um, are you looking at something like what Senator Ron White was proposing, where it's a mix of you know <clears throat> simplifications and closing of loopholes? Or are you looking at something more fundamental, like a flat tax scheme? I'm looking more for the former, something like Senator what, Senator White and others, in a bipartisan fashion, are proposing. Do you like uh, do you like White's proposal? This this last one I think was like. Nine months ago, like I think there are elements of this proposal that are, are, are fair and, and right, the kind of direction we, be ta we should be taking. I won't say right here, I, I, I uh, subscribe to everything within his proposal. Of course, I can't say that right now. But I also think that if you, if you create something that's more predictable and something that puts more money into the taxpayer pocket, you're going to see more investment. But right now, this 60-day this fix cycle that we're on in Congress, whether it's in the payroll tax, whether it be tax brackets, whatever it is, they don't seem to be able to make any long-term decisions. And as a business owner myself, it then makes me just sit on my hands because I don't know what the implications are or the ramifications are of hiring, of investing, whether it be in equipment or personnel. I don't know what my health care costs are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is exactly why we need to put people in Congress who come from a perspective and a background of working in the private sector who have hired people who know what it takes to make those tough decisions and also know what it takes to stop hiring. In other words, I, I know from my own experience what discourages me to hire. And a lot of it is policy or the lack thereof coming out of Washington, D.C. So, Rob, you're making a distinction. Mark, maybe it's a good time to get Suzanne to answer well, I would, I would just want to get one clarification that we're going to Suzanne with. So, um, would what you support in terms of taxes be a net increase in terms of revenue? And, and do you agree back to the original question of the statement that, that whatever solution occurs has to include both enhanced revenues and a reduction in the safety net? I mean, uh, that's a yes or no. Well, I don't think it's okay. I think it's a cleaning up of the safety net programs. It's, it's making sure that there's not billions and billions of dollars of fraud and waste. In, in the safety net program. So you're talking about Medicare, whether you're talking about the military, there's a lot of money that we're spending right now that we shouldn't be spending due to fraud and waste. So revenue neutral proposal? Yes. Or, and, and then would that necessarily require um, reduction in expenditure or something? Kind of. In what? So, so again, would, would, to get that revenue neutral, do you, does that require you to cut some programs? In uh, no, it requires us to increase the number, number of taxpayers we have, put more people back to work. So if you put people more, more people back to work, they're paying into the system as opposed to taking from the system because of their, of their unemployment status. Okay, so let's get to that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I certainly uh, applaud the super committee and others who are attempting to get things done in Washington, D.C., but I tell you, people are frustrated, and as I've traveled around the district, I can sense how frustrated they are with Congressman not doing, not doing its job. Uh, I don't believe that we need to cut Social Security and Medicare to resolve the issues here. Uh, I do not believe that. Uh, but there are promises we've made to our seniors, and when we talk about safety net, there are people who really rely on those programs uh, for their, their 
life for their health care. Uh, but we do have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of uh, tackling the debt and the deficit. I just believe we need to do it with the right priorities. And I don't think that seniors and those who are on disability and those who rely on safety net programs are the ones who, who, on whose back we should be balancing the budget. So we do need to start closing uh, loopholes, corporate loop, loopholes, and ending things like tax breaks for big oil companies that are making record profits. I support ending the Bush tax cuts on millionaires. We have to start tackling the debt and the deficit uh, and, do, and doing that with the right priorities. And then when, if we're investing in education and job training, uh, ending things like uh, subsidies to big agriculture businesses, uh, then we can start uh, creating jobs. And I have a short-term and a long-term uh, jobs plan. Uh, you know, Rob talks about uh, let's reform the tax code and then there'll be more jobs. That's the sort of trickle-down approach that uh, takes a long time if it, if it ever works. Uh, reforming the tax code is laudable, uh, but that's not something that's going to help the person in Cratsett County who's losing her house tomorrow, or the person in Yamhill County who needs a job next week, which is why I'll be working on both short-term and long-term proposals, including uh, helping small businesses get access to capital, uh, continuing the work that I did in the legislature, uh, getting people to work on infrastructure projects, rebuilding our roads, bridges, our energy system, promoting the use of work share, which is something we do in Oregon that we don't do enough of, which is to use as existing unemployment dollar to keep people on the job. And then in the longer term, improving our system of public education, lowering the cost for people so that higher education is more accessible and affordable, and making sure that we have the strong consumer protection laws we need to avoid another financial crisis like the one we're, we're digging out of right now. Good. So, Go ahead. I'm sorry. So I'm not clear. If, if I asked you right now if you supported the Senator Wyden and Senator Craig's proposal for tax reform, would you say yes or no? I would say not all of it. Not all of it. Okay. No, we, we, we do need, whenever I approach a tax proposal, I'll do just as I did in the legislature. I'll look at whether it uh, is a fair, meaning progressive, not regressive proposal. Uh, I'm not interested in, in uh, increasing the tax burden on, on middle class families or those who, who are, you know, low income struggling to get to the middle class. But we do need to have a fair tax structure and close uh, tax breaks and loopholes. So here's a question and then you can have it. Um, that gets to sort of people's definition of middle class. Currently, um, I believe the federal tax code allows uh, upon a death of, of a, uh, in a, in a state um, up to $5 million before it's taxed under the federal. That trigger is supposed to, on January 1st, 2013, go drop down to $1 million. Um, do you support, um, if, if nothing is done, then the, the estate tax limit will drop from $5 million for federal to $1 million. Do you support dropping it to $1 million, or would you like to see it, um, and if not, where would you like to see it go? I have to look at, I don't know that I support the $1 million, and I want to make sure that we have policy that does things like protect the family farm. We worked on that in the Oregon legislature. Uh, but we do have to look at whether we are giving away too much money in tax breaks and, and uh, tax expenditures. And Rob, you on that issue? Well, again, in 2013, uh, it, 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 you have to look at the whole picture, John. You just can't take one particular tax break and say, well, how do you feel about but what that? You, but, you, but you can't, because if, if Congress does nothing, then it drops from $5 million to $1 million. So I'm asking, are you, you, know what else would, happens? Would you... You know what else happens if Congress does nothing? On January 1st of 2013, the Bush slash Obama tax cuts expire. So the, the overall tax increase at that time would be terrific. And I don't, think, I don't think you can just look at one at a time. That's why I call it, you have to take a comprehensive approach to tax overhaul right now. So, and I, and I would add, regarding the, the Bush and Obama tax cuts, you know, we have to look at our deficit, $1.3 trillion. Those tax cuts, if they're eliminated, would, would bring us about $100 billion in new revenue, quote unquote. Okay, that's great. That sounds like some, a good start. But then we're now running a $1.2 trillion deficit. I mean, we got to get serious. Just the math says that type of approach may sound good in a campaign, but mathematically, it's not getting the job done. And then what are you going to do when those, people, when those tax rates are, have been eliminated or when those tax breaks have been eliminated? We don't have, we're not encouraging wealth in this country anymore. I have a follow-up from what Suzanne said about not uh, not taking away any Medicare benefits. Right now, we got one out of every six dollars spent 
in the U.S. Our, our GMP goes to healthcare. Uh, I look around this room, we have a lot of people who are probably going to be using Medicare someday. Uh, there's a bubble coming up. Uh, but that percent of GMP keeps getting higher, and we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world that's not the most effective for right. many people. So what do we do there to keep those costs from sure. bankrupt, bankrupting the whole country? Right. Well, well, but thank you. And first I want to add that the costs in the Medicare system are rising more slowly than the costs in, in the, the private insurance market. So uh, cutting back on Medicare isn't going to address the problem, which is why I won't look at any Medicare proposal that doesn't have cost containment. So what we need to do in Medicare is, uh, first of all, negotiate prescription drug costs. Uh, now, when you know, Rob and I both applied for the nomination of the independent party, uh, which I was proud to have, have earned, and they asked what approaches we would take for Medicare, and I checked the box. We need to negotiate prescription drug costs. Rob did not check that box. That's a place to start. Also, there's a significant amount of, of money spent in Medicare uh, in, in the, the procedures and tests that don't need to be done, uh, and Medicare fraud cracked down on those. But your question, I think, was more general about over, uh, overall health care costs. Until we have more uh, access, until we have more people covered, we aren't going to drive down costs. Because what happens when people are not covered? Uh, by they, if they don't have insurance, either through their employer, if they can't afford insurance, they can't qualify for something like the Oregon Health Plan, they go without preventive care. And they get their health care in the most expensive way possible. That's in the emergency rooms. And I saw that firsthand. When I spent a day with the Washington County Sheriff riding around Washington County, we made two trips to the emergency room just in one day. So if, until we have that access, until we have coverage, we aren't going to drive down costs because those costs are all shifted, and, and that runs off costs. So having more people covered is going to start driving down costs, uh, making sure that uh, we have that insurance accessible like uh, the insurance exchanges that are coming out of the Affordable Care Act. Oregon is right now setting up the exchange that's going to make uh, insurance more affordable and accessible, a more competitive market for individuals and small businesses. Also, the transformation uh, bill that uh, Oregon passed, where we're working on getting more community health care centers so that people can get that preventive care that they need. I'm also proud to be endorsed by the Oregon Nurses Association because uh, when you're looking for cost-effective health care, you want the person practicing at the top of their scope uh, but you want the most cost-effective, uh, efficient care, and sometimes that's from a nurse and a foreign nurse practitioner. You know, so all of those things help to drive down. Suzanne, you mentioned you mentioned um, um, endorsements, and I was interested to see that uh, Bob Herman and Dave Pronmeyer uh, both endorsed you. Yes. Um, Rob, did you ask for their endorsements? No. Why not? Uh, I don't have a relationship. With them. Can you tell me who in? Uh, the first district you look up to as a political mentor? As a mentor? Political mentor? Someone who lives and works in the first district exclusively? No. Somebody, a political figure from the first district. Sure. Uh, uh, Vic Atia lives in the first district. And Vic Atia, you know, he's been out of the public eye for many years, but uh, when I grew up in Oregon, uh, as I was graduating from high school, he became our governor. And he's the last Republican governor we had in Oregon. And Vic Atia has qualities that I would like to emulate. Do you know him? Yes, I do. He's actually the, the honorary chairman of my campaign. Uh, but I, the, the endorsements I frankly am most proud of, in fact, just yesterday we had an event where 21 district-wide mayors stepped forward and endorsed me. And uh, we, we would have loved to have the media there. We invited media. We would have loved to have either, either one of your organizations there. But these 21 mayors have all said, essentially, of all the people running for this office, the two of us, we think Rob Cornelis is more apt, more qualified, to assist us in growing jobs in our respective communities. Um, and, and I would add, just so your viewers and readers know, that represents about 70% of the mayors in the district, and these were not just Republican mayors, it couldn't be that. These are Republican, Independent, and Democrat mayors, and that to me is the greatest endorsement. Suzanne, uh, the Oregonian reported that you couldn't remember a time uh, that you voted against a tax or fee increase. First of all, I'll give you a quick chance, you know, you can tell me if that's an accurate quotation. But um, then in what ways, uh, state tax, property tax, capital gains, whatever, are, are Americans taxed enough already? Uh, well, first of all, when I said I couldn't remember a, a tax or fee increase, 
that I didn't vote for. You have to understand that, that the way the Oregon legislative process works is that uh, proposals are brought forward, they go through the committee. I didn't serve on the revenue committee, so there were lots of things that were considered, vetted, and then when they're uh, when they receive a bipartisan vote and move on to the committee to the floor, it's when they're vetted. So there were, I'm sure there were several text proposals that came up in committees that I might not have supported. But I wasn't on that committee, so the ones that made it to the floor after thorough vetting, uh, I, I remember voting for those. But I also want to point out that the claim that's being made uh, on television ads against me that I voted for 60 tax increases has been found to be so false that they said Rob's pants are on fire. I don't smell any smoke right now, well, but... Uh, that's okay, and I've, read, that, I, and I've read that, so let's not litigate that here. So. But, but, that, but, but that's just not true. That the, the 60 tax increases have not come before the Oregon legislature. Some of those were, were you know, user fees. That, they even well, in fact, Oregon says it's like 14 or something. So, right. so where's where, so, to get to Christian's question, where sure. do you think people are, are, at, are at the least the limit, if not overtaxed? In, in Oregon? Or well, in, in, in federally? Country, federally, I mean, well, things that you'll work on in Congress. Sure. Uh, I, I believe the Oregon income tax is too high, but that's state income tax. So what we need to do is make sure that everyone, you know, ta tax involves uh, those who are, are paying their fair share, but it also involves responsibility, making sure that when people owe the taxes, they pay them. So uh, closing the loopholes, making sure that the tax burden is fair, that it is progressive, not regressive. Uh, those, that's what I'll be looking for. And can you just think of, off the top of your head anything that where you're, you know, you've looked at the rates and you've said, oh, that's, that's a fine rate or that rate should come down or anything like that? Not specifically, no. Rob? Well, I, I do think it's worth pointing out when she was asked why the marriage fee increase that she voted for, she said, well, because it hadn't been done in a while. And I just think that's a kind of a, an insight of the way that Suzanne thinks. And I, I think voters need to need to be informed and they have the right to ask, well, when real, have you had enough money? Real quickly, real quickly, is that a fair? No. Okay. Well, not, not then at all, let's, because let's it wasn't a marriage fee and it, then, it, then it let's, let's throw it out. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. Fee then that's, that's fine. So, no. so what about my question, Ross? Is there, is there a tax or a fee, you know, is there is there something you can point to, you know, whether it's the estate tax or it's the income tax or whatever, the, the, Americans are passing up already. Is there one specific thing that you would like to reduce? Oh, sure. I think, I, I, as I said earlier, I think the rates across the board need to be lower. Federal so, but any, any specific, any specific? Federal income tax, federal personal income tax. Income tax. Is, there, is there corporate tax? Corporate tax. I mean, our corporate tax is the highest in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that our corporations shouldn't should do their part. But I think that can be accomplished if you, again, eliminate many of the corporate loopholes and deductions that exist. And because right now, they may. No one actually pays those mega corporations. They're not paying 39% rate. We all know it. And why aren't they? Because they're clever enough to get through the system and to get around the system. So when people talk about, well, let's raise rates even further, the fact of the matter is that the big boys have a lot of lawyers and lobbyists and friends in high places to work around the system. So it's, you know, my opponent wants to raise taxes on a broken system. I want to fix the system. Uh, now, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that Suzanne wants to raise taxes. On well, she said she wants to eliminate out. the Bush tax cuts. That's a tax increase. The Bush tax cuts are going to go away at the end of next year anyway. If if we don't put in, in place or, uh, an overhaul of the tax. So you rate. think that, let's just, I mean, let me back up here. Pew Research came out with, this, with a study yesterday. They, they interviewed 2,048 people. 66% of the people said that income inequality was one of the highest and most pressing problems this country faces. That was an increase by 19 percentage points from 2009. So giving more money to millionaires and billionaires and keeping the rate for them in those tax cuts is a priority for you? No. So you would, you would strip that out and only keep the middle class tax cut? Remember what I said earlier, eliminate loopholes, lower rates. Eliminating loopholes disallows the mega rich and the super wealthy to work around the tax code. So, and you were, that was you were talking about the White and Judd, uh, Judd Gray uh, situation, the proposal. So, so I want to kind of move off the tax policy a little bit. I did want to just ask one more question. And, and you said that you would favor uh, eliminating the Bush tax cuts. Are you specifically, are you saying? All of them are only, as Obama has suggested, for people above a certain Only, only for high income. And, and what's, what's your cutoff? 
well, I've talked about eliminating them for millionaires. I don't think we need to be continuing tax breaks for millionaires. But I wanted to, to respond to what Kevin was saying because I saw that study about the, the perception and, and the concern about income inequality and how that is a tremendous concern. And I think it's the reason why we saw so many people out on the streets and in the, in the park. And, and I wanted to talk about uh, how I see investment in education as the real way to address income inequality. And, and in fact, I'll credit Nicholas Kristof for his column called Occupy the Classroom. But there are people right now who want to cut programs like Head Start. And, and if you want to, to really move toward true income equality, you give equal opportunity to every child from any background. And that happens in our public school system. And so uh, I'm not interested in cutting programs like Head Start. I think we need to be keeping those investments to make sure that every child, regardless of background, regardless of, of, of where, what home they're from or the income level of their parents, can get that opportunity to go through a public school system. And they may be the next innovator, the next Steve Jobs, the next creator. Uh, so so that's that's what I want to do in, in response to the concern about education. Can I speak about education? Or yeah, go ahead, go ahead and uh, respond to Dr. Steve and ask the question. We, we have to make sure that our public education system is more competitive in this country. And one way you do that, one way you do that, is you make sure that the resources that are being funneled to Washington, D.C. stay local. And you also make sure that our public classrooms are not as crowded as they are today. One way to accomplish that is to give parents more choice in where their kids are educated. This is why I support the open enrollment, which the state legislature passed, governor signed, Suzanne was opposed to it. Suzanne wants to follow the, the lead of the, of the teachers' unions, but rather a lot of teachers would like to have the shackles taken off and allow them to educate the kids with resources and with, with evaluations that the teachers feel would be best, not necessarily the unions. So parents need the choice, teachers need more opportunity to use flexibility and their own good judgment in the classroom. This is why the Beaverton School Board President and Vice Chair, these two women have both endorsed me because they believe I'd be friendlier to creating that type of change there certainly are in our state. Members that have endorsed them. The, the majority of them. The I, majority of the people. I, I don't dispute that. Um, maybe I can uh, jump in here, Rob. Uh, you, you talked eloquently about uh, corporate loopholes, and I know this is a state issue, but it's the same kind of thing you have to deal with if you're elected to Congress. We have some. Businesses in your district say Intel and Nike who have successfully lobbied the state to avoid uh, property taxes on a lot of their infrastructure. In the case of Intel, and in the case of both companies, corporate taxes because they have a strong presence here. So we don't know exactly what they're paying, but their their effective state corporate tax rate went way down uh, at the expense of other companies doing business here. You're going to be faced with those same kind of pressures in in D.C. to use the tax code to help your constituents or others. How do you respond to this approach when an, an Intel or Nike comes to or somebody else says, oh, we think we should do this because it's going to do this and this for our work? Well, the number one issue, or excuse me, the number one question I would always ask myself regarding any piece of legislation or proposal that's brought to me is, will this effectively create long-term jobs in this country? If it's a temporary fix, I'm not interested in it. We need long-term certainty. You're right, it's a state issue. I'll let the state legislature grapple with that. What I would say, though, is nobody can argue, and this is why I was pleased to be invited to Intel today and speak to their employees. Nobody can argue with the fact that Intel's growth has been good for Oregon, it's certainly been good for our district. And it has, it has promoted and, and produced businesses which support Intel. The fact of the matter is that every, every corporation relies on small businesses to provide them with, with supplies and goods, services. So we can't just look at, we just can't look at and say, well, what is what good for one business? We have to ask ourselves, what's good for the region? What's good for the industries that we want to promote, that we want to project? What's good for the clusters that we're developing in this area? Frankly, the first district, I think, has some of the greatest assets in the state. I think the best district in the state for a number of reasons. And we are the epicenter of economic activity in this state. I don't want to do anything that's going to decrease our ability to be competitive and prosperous here. So let's move on to uh, some different topics. And both of you talk about the frustration that people have about the red law and uh, differences. And, uh, 
So, you know, I'm curious, or we're curious, you know, could, could each of you name uh, three things that President Obama has done right and three things that he's done wrong? Three things that he's done right. Uh, I certainly support the Affordable Care Act. Not perfect, but it is helping with uh, the prohibition against pre existing conditions, uh, making sure that states are setting up insurance exchanges. Absolutely agree with that. I agree that uh, the, the President supports the uh, Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, and it's unfortunate that the uh, confirmation of the director was blocked and I support the president's appointment of, an, of the director uh, to get that agency up and going. They're going to do good work in making sure that we have strong consumer protection laws. Uh, and I also support the president's efforts to uh, end the war in Iraq and bring the troops home from Afghanistan. Those are three things I support. Uh, I don't support uh, some of the president's education policies. I wasn't particularly fond of race to the top because of the competitive nature of it. I believe that states need to be improving their education policy, but they should be doing that based on what's good for the states, what's good for the students, and not based on a, a dangling the possibility of receiving some money in front of them. So I don't necessarily agree with all the education uh, policies. Uh, I, I'm a, concerned about the um, the uh, legislation that just passed uh, has to do with the indefinite detention. I know that the president has indicated uh, that, that there's going to be inter interpretations of it that don't violate constitutional rights, but I think that that should have been stronger in its passage. And a third thing where I don't agree with the president. Um, well, this is a migrant area where you have <laughs> Right, you no, have I know. Back to you, back to you, stop it. Don't worry, we can come back to you. Did you say Department of Commerce? Yeah. <laughs> I have a hunch Rob can come up with three, so let's yeah. see. <laughs> I, I, I came up with three on both sides very easy. Things that the President has done well, uh, he, uh, he has been a champion to make sure that the free trade agreements were finally authorized, and he signed them late last year because he recognizes how trade creates jobs in this country. And I would add, uh, if he knew the power of trade for the first district, uh, he would say that that's one of the best things that Congress and he have done to benefit the first district. Uh, second, um, his, uh, his desire to make sure that our returning veterans go to the front of the hiring line when it comes to helping them find the skills that would lead to jobs when they come home moving them from helmets to hard hats, as it said. I think that's a fantastic thing that the president should use the bully pulpit to make sure it uh, happens, and I fully support that, and it's, it's kind of right down my wheelhouse because I, I train people for careers professionally. And the third thing is I applaud the president for, in 2010, uh, uh, commissioning the Bowles Simpson Commission when he brought the, a bipartisan effort together to look at ways to reduce the national debt. Um, now, the, uh, the three things where I find difference with the president, let's start with the last. He commissioned the Bull Simpson, and then when they submitted their report in December of 2010, he effectively put it in his desk drawer and didn't do anything about it. And didn't use the power of the bully pulpit to make sure that we take real action based in Congress to reduce, reduce our deficit and our debt. Uh, that to me was a, was a real missed opportunity for the president. Um, I also think that he has been, frankly, very divisive in the way that he has taken, taken this idea that people who want to create jobs, people who want to invest in job creation, um, that, that they are not as qualified or not as good at doing that as government is. And I think he's created a divisive attitude in this country, or I should say he's contributed to that, which is very unfortunate. Business, government, nonprofit, we all need to be working together to grow this economy. It's not just one person, and it's not just one sector of our society. And the other thing that I think is very disappointing is the Affordable Care Act has not driven down the cost of health care like he and so many others told us it would. So for us to now be asking the question, how are we going to drive down health care, I think, frankly, is testament to the fact that that bill didn't do what they said it was going to do. And it's put us in a real pickle. 
And when I, as a small business owner, want to hire, right now that's one of the pieces of uncertainty. I don't know what's going to cost me to make sure that my employees and their families are, are properly covered. And because of that, I, I don't know if I can take the potential financial risk in hiring more people or giving them the benefits I want to give them or can, that I can't afford to give them. So we haven't fixed health care in this country, and there's been three years now for him to do it, and it's not been done. I think we are we're really hurting as a country because of it. Did you think of a third? I did. I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. You know, it's in the third. Uh, the, the payroll tax deduction negotiation, is my understanding, is the president worked hard to come up with a plan, uh, and then it got turned around, and I wish he would have negotiated hard, harder to make sure that that was more than a, a two-month with these uh, other agreements tacked onto it, that he could, could have been a better negotiator. Uh, I've got, um, so, so in Congress, uh, you will have to vote on a lot of, a lot of things. Um, one thing that's going on in Congress right now, uh, the bill to come up with the Couple of toys right now. It's called the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, I want to know if either of you have a position, and um, uh, if you if you don't support it, what would have to change in the bill for you to support it, or if that's just impossible sure. to say it's impossible. To so, say SOPA, and it's yeah. called the Stop Online Piracy Act, and then PIPA, which is an acronym for the the, the other bill. Uh, I've, I've looked at and read at and read uh, about both of those and talked to people about them. Uh, I've uh, and, and spoken with businesses in the district who will be impacted by them. We do have to do what we can to make sure that we're protecting the intellectual property rights of uh, companies, absolutely. But I'm concerned that both the Stop Online Privacy Act, SOPA, and PIPA would have unintended consequences. So uh, Senator Wyden and Senator Cantwell, and I forgot there's another, there's a Republican uh, co-sponsor as well, thank you. Are, are working on an alternative. It's open, it's an all these acronyms. Open is an acronym for their alternative. Uh, what we need to do is work to make sure that we're, we're providing appropriate protections for the, the, uh, the intellectual property, but not hindering innovation. And I tell you, 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 you talk to young people who are working in technology today, and they're all fired up in their opposition to these bills because they're very concerned about how they're going to stifle you know, innovation and creativity. And so at this point, um, it um, sounds like there's not much that can change. The, the, the current proposal would have to change a lot for you to support it. So. Yes. Rob? Uh, I, uh, I believe that SOPA is a well-intentioned bill, but I would not support it uh, because we need to protect intellectual property in this country. And as one who provides a service, as one who has developed intellectual property myself, I know how important that is to uh, protect that and, and to make sure that uh, those who are innovators know that we're standing behind them. At the same time, uh, uh, I also think it's the wrong approach, SOPA is the wrong approach, because it's putting too much power in the Department of Justice to, if you will, just determine uh, which websites they want to pull down. If there's one area of our, uh, our economy that is thriving right now, it would be e-commerce, and I don't want to impede that progress. Uh, so I say there's a, there's a, an approach in Congress right now, Daryl Issa on the Republican side, Ron Wyden on the Democrat side, they're coming together and they're saying uh, SOPA has a good idea, but we need to be more careful, more prudent, and as I understand it, they're taking up this conversation next week, and, uh, and I think we're going to come to a bipartisan solution here that everyone will feel good about. That would be a shocker. How about LNG? I don't think it's come up in recently. Um, what should the feds return to the states the right to determine uh, the siting of liquid natural gas terminals? Absolutely. It hasn't really come up because, at least in our district, it's not as hot a topic as it was, say, a year, year and a half ago. But absolutely, the, uh, that, that's a local decision. And as a federal official, you know, I want to be there in support of what the local communities want within, within, their, within the district. So you would seek a change to the provision in the 2005 Energy Act that brought that that the siting approval to FERC of any way from the states? Right, I would stand with our delegation and say, no, it needs to be left on the local level. Excuse me? Likewise, I, I believe Senator Wyden uh, has legislation to do that, to put siting decisions to the states. Okay, so, um, yeah. One thing that's been a problem in the past is that constituents have talked about their, their ability to have access to their Congress and so I'm wondering what kind of plan you have to not 
lose sight of your constituents and to remain available to them and to be talking to them about what what is uh, what is their what their concerns are. So thank I'd you. like to know what you'd like. But thank you, Christina. Uh, and as someone who has served constituents for uh, for my term in the legislature, you know, beginning in 2007, 2009, 2011, I understand the importance of that. Uh, I had to, had in the legislature and will have an open door policy. Uh, somebody one time came to see me in the Capitol and they wanted to know if I had a check to see if, if they had donated money to me before they could get an appointment. And I, I was shocked that somebody would even ask that question. Uh, I, I will be accessible to my constituents. I plan to do town halls across the district, uh, looking at where district offices can be located, uh, and want to be uh, accessible as possible. I did a, a regular email a news update for my constituents when I was in the legislature will continue to do that and do as much outreach uh, as possible and also get around the district and travel around the district so constituent services is a very critical part of, of serving in a legislative body and I have a proven record in fact I have constituents supporting me I had a constituent who came to me back in 2007 with a problem uh, it required legislation and uh, we've got the legislation passed and he's supporting my campaign and <coughs> she didn't even look to see but I'm a Republican at constituents in the last uh, legislative session who told me about the problem they were having I looked into it I worked how to do with real estate I worked with the real estate commissioner and the Oregon realtors got legislation passed on their behalf that would not necessarily help them but prevent what happened to them in the future so not only have I helped constituents with you know, agency issues and and, and uh, you know, working with state agencies. Uh, I've also uh, worked on passing legislation to to benefit constituents, and, and that's the job of a legislator. So, uh, you know, the Oregonian said that. Um, sorry, I mentioned your competitor. Uh, that that a seat in Congress is not an entry level position, and and you know, I, I agree with that. You, you want someone who has a record uh, is, so that people know this is how someone is going to act. This is how someone is going to serve constituents. This is someone's voting record that people can look at to see where where someone's positions are. So but constituent services, top of my list. Suzanne, uh, I think Ron Wyden took, went to Congress in an entry-level position. He's done okay. Or do you disagree? Do you think he floundered? No, I don't think he, he floundered. So no, it's possible for someone it, to... It is possible. Okay. But it's, it's seldom that that happens. In fact... Um, I was using a different example, so you didn't. <laughs> 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 well, I'd, like to, I'd like to hear from you on, on what your what your plan is. Thank you. I'm not sure why you would support the David Wilson Schultz because he's not think you worked out very well. Um, actually, uh, there's a lot of thoughts on this, Christina. First of all, um, Congress is not an entry level job if you've never created a job before, and right now the number one issue in our country is job creation something I've done, something which Suzanne can't claim. As far as constituent services, in my business for years, I've been consulting and training organizations to do just that, to take care of their customers, their clients. And, uh, and we've been doing this all over the country. That's why uh, household name brands travel all the way to Tualatin, Oregon, to get our advice on how to take care of their fans, their customers, their clients, etc., their vendors. So I think I've been well prepared to take care of vendors, excuse me, of, of constituents, I don't know why I said vendors, <laughs> constituents <laughs> right here in the first district. I also think it's important that they know that their, their member of Congress is someone who doesn't care about their party affiliation, who may not even share their views, but still willing to listen to them. In our debate that we had last Friday at the, at the uh, City Club, Suzanne unfortunately said, as it relates to a particular group of people, in our district that she doesn't really understand them. She thinks they think this and that. My comment is, it doesn't matter if you agree with them, you still need to try to understand them and not dismiss them. And, and I would not dismiss them. In fact, I know that none of your newspapers extend out to the North Coast, but I've already committed to people on the North Coast that if I'm elected, we will set up a congressional office there in the North Coast in Clatsop County because I feel they've been largely ignored. And, uh, and they don't feel like they have a voice in Congress. They have some very specific key issues there that need to be addressed, and I want them to know I'll have a presence there. So um, can could I, just, I ask? Well, OK, actually, uh, we're at uh, oh. 317. I want to give Mike Donahue a chance to 
okay. uh, ask some of the questions that the viewers sent in, and then if we've got a couple minutes, we'll allow you to sort of make a, a little bit of a pitch. Can I just yeah, you clarify the, okay, I just wanted to clarify the group that Rob was talking about was the Tea Party. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like a, a, a group of business people or a group. And, and yes, of course I'll be representing everyone, just as I have in the legislature. The fact that I don't understand how Tea Party people think doesn't mean that I don't want to represent them. Mike, Mike you ready? Moral of the Earth. Okay. Okay. All right. This was a question asked most often by viewers in several different forms. But um, Keith, Royce, Jessica, and Thomas all wanted to know why go for the smear campaigns, belittling each other? Why not take the high road and focus on the positive things you've done? What an excellent question, Keith, uh, and and all the people who asked it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for asking. It. Uh, during the primary, I'm proud to say that I ran a positive campaign. That's what voters want. That's what they want to hear. On the day after the primary campaign, first thing in the morning, Rob made a claim against me of, about I wanted to cut Medicare that PolitiFact found was false. And the attacks continued, continued, continued. And then when the ad went up, I always said, I want to run a positive campaign, but I need to be able to respond. When the ad went up, the, the Pants on Fire ad, about uh, how many tax increases I supported, I responded to that. Uh, frankly, the voters want to hear positive uh, messages. I've been talking about my jobs plan, what I'll do for the community, my record, but I have to respond to, to false attacks that but, are made against But me. Suzanne, this goes beyond responding. That's not mine. That is not mine, John. So you don't like Trust this? Trust me, that you is don't not like mine. This. I had nothing to do with no, that. I didn't see it until she it came to my question, office. John. You asked her. She, you asked her. Do you not like this? Right. So I'd like to know the answer. No, I don't like it. How, it if it's true, voters need to know the information that's true. I, artistically, I think it's tech. Sorry, but um, but if it's true, voters need to know the information. But just to clarify, that is not mine. And have you told the Democratic Party of Oregon that you do not appreciate this? They know that. <laughs> but from did it come from you? Do you it did, now. Did, Say right now that you don't appreciate this. You want them to stop. <laughs> okay, Democratic Party of Oregon. I would, if you're going to put out information, please make sure that it's true. If that's true, then I, I can't criticize the truth of it. Why well, don't you ask me if it's true? Fine. Is it true? That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right, well, I don't want to cut into the reader's time, so go ahead. So, so how would you answer right. that question? Well, it's, it's uh, almost offensive to suggest that the readers and viewers don't really know what happened in this campaign. Since August 4th, the day I announced my candidacy, the Democratic Party, based in Washington, D.C., and some here in the state, have been funding individuals to do nothing but try to discredit me. And this is long before I won my party's nomination. They have followed me with cameras, even into churches. They have called my corporate headquarters, game face, they've called my company and harassed my employees. Even Suzanne's political consultant's office called my employees to harass them, seeking information to try to make me look bad. And they've had a million and a half dollars spent or reserved to try to assassinate my character and mischaracterize my views or things that I've said or have not said. Finally, a week ago, I responded. Voters know this. They're not fooled by it. I have no mailers out doing this type of thing. The Republican Party has not participated in this type of behavior. She has not denounced it. She has not asked them to stop. And so I'm simply a small business owner from Tualatin who's saying enough is enough. This is the t same type of political games that have gotten our state into this mess that we even have to have a special election. These are the same people who covered up for David Wu. Now they're trying to discredit me. Voters are smarter than that. Yeah, question. Oh, excuse me. Well, I just go ahead. I have to say, I only have one child, but I think if I had two, I would have heard he started it, she started it, because that's what it sounds like you guys are saying. Right? This, you know, the whole. It can sound what it wants. Just check yeah. the record. Check the record. You tell me how many Republican operatives have been stalking Suzanne since August. Well, I'll say, I'll say, okay. the, I'll say the, I'll say the, I'll say the, and I think I, I don't think it's useful to litigate this right now. I know, I know what you're saying that the DPO spent money to track you from the start, that's absolutely true. I'm certain that if there was not a Democratic Party and there was a clear front runner and Suzanne was it, the same thing would happen on the other side. I, there's, so. a, there's a tracker following me around as well, and the Republican Party has done public records requests to my office, to Business Oregon about a bill I worked on. I turned over every single record of how I ran my office budget happily 
to them and without complaining. So the, well, the, same, thing is, the same thing is happening. And, and I'm a private business and, owner. And can I just, I just want to clarify something too that, that Rob said about somebody in my office called his office, not to harass, but when we found out that, you know, Rob's running on his record as a small business owner. You are, Rob. We found out that his business is sitting there empty and there's nobody there. That's somebody not true. called and said, uh, what, what is your address? That was the question. What is your address? The person who answered the phone said, we don't work in the business, we work at home. And he said, where are you? And he said, Daytona Beach, Florida. So that, that was the extent of the phone call. It wasn't harassing. It was, what is your address? That's Mike, since you've opened up the can of worms, <laughs> obviously, that is not a true statement. Part of it is true. I have one employee in Daytona Beach. That's the employee who happened to, they pressed the right button to get that employee. Most of my employees, all the other employees, live right here in Oregon. We set up a home-based business with those for those employees four years ago, 2008. But, but is the office in is the office in, in Twelfton still open? It closed in 2008. We moved to home-based businesses. That was the economic model we decided to pursue. And so, so the reporting will have to says that the about it the address and all that stuff. It suggests that we are misleading people. That that wasn't even our office. We leased the space. If that had been released, it wouldn't look empty today, would it? But it, because it looks empty, it looks like we are hiding something. Those are home. We are now have. We have now home-based employees, and they didn't ask questions. They called my employees and hung up on my employees when the employees were asking where they were from. That's harassment. That's the kind of stuff that has to stop in the state if we want to encourage economic activity and businesses from doing what we need, and that is grow jobs and grow this economy. Yeah, question for <laughs> question for Rob. This is from Bill. How and why do you want to change Social Security and Medicare? First of all, I don't want to privatize either one. And that's another mischaracterization that's been coming out of the ads that have been running against me for weeks. I've never said I want to privatize Social Security or Medicare. In fact, I opposed Congressman Ryan last year who tried to propose that from the Republican Party. And I was one of the few Republicans who stood up and said that's wrong. So how do we how do we salvage it? Is that the other part of the question, Mike? Yes. Well, it's well, once again, I would encourage members of Congress, and I intend to be a part of that body, to open up the Bull Simpson report, which the President commissioned, and let's begin there. First of all, I did say that she wants to she wants to take Medicare, excuse me, money away from Medicare because she does. John Kerry even said that when they passed the Affordable Care Act, they took $550 billion out of Medicare. She supports the Affordable Care Act. That's the connection. I don't support that. Medicare has been, and Social Security are both promises we've made to seniors, and they've paid into the system. It needs to be there for them. But there are a lot of practical, practical fixes to both. Social Security is easier. Such things as mean testing, means testing such things as uh, providing people with early payments at 62 and deferring till later, such things as uh, adjusting the CPI. These are easy fixes to make sure that Social Security is there long term. But these fixes would not take place immediately for today's seniors or beneficiaries. They would have to take place down the road for those people. And last thing I want to say about Social Security, when it, in 1950 we had 16 American workers for every one Social Security beneficiary. Today we have three for every one beneficiary. So if we want to salvage Social Security long term, we need more people paying into it. We need to create jobs. That's why my campaign is all about job creation. That's Suzanne, uh, what is for Bob, what kind of laws would you vote for to deal with illegal immigration? Well, thank you, Bob. We need to have a comprehensive immigration reform. And first, we need to start out with doing a better job down on our borders, especially cracking down on the trafficking of drugs, trafficking of humans, we need to, to address that issue. Uh, I believe that we need to come up with a path for citizenship for law-abiding people who are here. I don't think we can ship them all back. This is where we need experience of people bringing people around the table, working together in a bipartisan way, just like I did in the Oregon legislature. You may know that uh, I chaired the redistricting committee for the Senate in the last session. This is something that everybody said, you can't get that done, it's too contentious. You'll never be able to do it. The House is split. You'll send it to the Secretary of State. It'll be fought out in the courts. We got it done. That's the kind of background uh, we need. You want a, a complex issue, you send someone to Congress who has experience dealing with complex issues in finding bipartisan solutions. One more, Mark. Is that okay? Yes. Please, go ahead. Um, this would actually be for both of you from Todd. 
Will you push for the immediate repeal of the NDAA, the National Defense uh, Authorization Act, and its security measures, which uh, Todd feels are unconstitutional? Well, that's the, thank you, Todd. That, that's the issue that I talked about before. I'll be looking very carefully at that. The president has uh, written that he will interpret the provisions as allowing an unconstitutional restraint uh, in violation of civil rights. Uh, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So whether we need to repeal it to do that or whether we need to strengthen provisions is something I'll be looking at. I'll yield to the lawyer on this one. I, I don't know enough about the issue to be able to offer a firm opinion. When you were 21, who was your political model and why? Uh, Mark Hatfield for me. Because uh, uh, the reason why is that Mark Hatfield shares my party affiliation. He did. He was, a, he was an honorable Republican from Oregon. Uh, but I think everybody from Oregon felt that it didn't matter what party you were, Mark represented you. And, uh, and he, was our, he was our senator. He was our governor. And I think that's the type of, re we need to return to that type of leadership. The people need to have that type of confidence in their elected leaders. They don't today. Well, to be honest with you, when I was 21, I wasn't paying attention to politics. So I didn't have a political hero at the time. But, but now I look at people like Wayne Morse, uh, who served uh, in, in, in uh, Oregon, uh, and uh, people like Maureen Newberger, who was one of our first women in the delegation. Uh, so in, in terms of Oregon heroes, uh, those would be uh, some examples for me. Uh, I'm proud to have support from uh, both former Congresswoman Les Quine and for, former Congresswoman Elizabeth Burse, uh, who served this first district, and uh, I would be honored to have your support as well. Thank you for the opportunity to interview with you. Thanks for coming in. And, uh, actually, I think that was probably a pretty good way to close on a, on a positive note, unless anybody has uh, any pressing questions we didn't get to. So um, thank you. And you know, our process is that, that we discuss it among ourselves and, and come to a conclusion and do uh, further research. And uh, we'll probably publish uh, something online early as uh, Monday or so, and then have it in our print editions next week. So, thank thank you, you for the opportunity. And I have contact information there on the cards if you have any follow-up questions. Please feel free to let me know. I appreciate the format as well, and appreciate uh, being able to discuss this with you, Suzanne. Thank you. Likewise, Thank you. Thank you.